All right, let's go. Let's do this. All right. All right, bigger pockets, friends and family, people across the fruited plain of America. Let's go. How are you? Let's go. All right, I got a little echo here. Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Paul Moore, and I've still got a few settings to check out here, but I wanted to see if you can tell me if you can hear me. So if you're in the chat box, please say something. Give me a thumbs up, give me a like, uh, give me something to tell me that you are there. So, welcome everybody on the Saturday morning. Again, I'm Paul Moore and we're going to be talking about the easiest way to invest in multifamily real estate. Okay, so Laura, hey Laura, hey Dale, good morning. You can hear me loud and clear, that's great news. Okay, so... I'm on Facebook, Bigger Pockets, and YouTube, and I've got folks on each saying you can hear me. That's fantastic. Hey, Juan. Hey, Combatives. Austin. Joel. Tamara. Ryan. Security Fraud. What? Is that your name? Hey, Palenka. Hey, Chris. Botanicals. Junius. Sherry. El Conquistador. Sick White. Snow White. Yvonne. Corbo. Habib. From Korea. Hey, Habib. From Korea. We're so glad you're here. Hey, Paul. Amita Gordon. Hey, Kevin Stewart. How are you? Dale Hanson. Good morning to you. Heather from Tulsa. Okay, I just bought a new bass guitar. My friend in Tulsa went and picked it up in Oklahoma City. It was a real specialty bass. So, uh, good morning, Chad. Good morning, Lashika. Okay, it sounds like everybody can hear me. We've got a lot of people on here today. And we got a lot to cover. So, uh, first of all, I'm trying to look a little more like Brandon. Turner. I added a beard when I was in Northwest Ontario fishing a few weeks ago and I got a little bit of sun as well. So hopefully I'm not looking as pale as usual. Um, if you are on Bigger Pockets Live, I am still struggling to see you guys. So just give me a second here and we will get going. So if you like what we're doing here, if you like Bigger Pockets, you can help us out a lot today by sharing this. A thumbs up, a like, a smiley face, a share. It actually goes into the algorithm that uh, Google and others use to rank bigger pockets and rank these events. So if you want to help us out, if you want to help me out, help yourself, help the community, give us a like, give us a share, give us a thumbs up, and get ready with your questions today because I have been on a journey to understand how to invest in multifamily for years. And today we're going to talk about multifamily investing, why it's such a great place to invest, and seven different paths, and actually more like 10 paths to get into multifamily. If you're like me, a lot of you are struggling trying to figure out how to get into multifamily, how to do a better job at it. So today, in just a minute, we are going to uh, start discussing how to invest in multifamily. So get your questions ready. Uh, we're going to actually have... We're going to talk about the easy... Elijah says, do you drink coffee? Yeah, I do. Um, you're going to send me some? Hey, Donnie in Michigan. Hey, Jason. Uh, this is the most people I've ever seen on here. This is amazing. Larry, Tasmir, Terrell Roberts. Hello, Chris. Uh, Richard from North Carolina. So where are you from? If you are from somewhere, that's a joke, uh, tell me where you're from. And we're going to get going talking about the easiest way to invest in multifamily. So... Uh, we're going to start by me giving a little presentation uh, about the easiest way to invest in multifamily and then we're going to, thanks Tony, uh, then we're going to get into some Q&A, okay? So, first of all, uh, Elijah, why'd you ask if I drink coffee? Am I, am I, am I like, do I look down or depressed? I, I'm not actually, or do I look like too energetic? So, uh, I was just on my rebounder a minute ago like Tony Robbins, so... Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. So, Fernando, Patrick, uh, hello, Nicholas. Um, great to see you on here again. Okay, here we're gonna go. Here we go. So, why do people want to invest in multifamily? All of a sudden, since the last Great Recession, there's just a lot of people out there who want to invest in multifamily. And the question is why? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, the Sharp Ratio, S H A R P E, was developed in the 70s by a guy named Guess what? Sharp. And um, he, is, he divides the return 
on a long-term basis divided by the risk, which is the instability, you know, the ups and downs of the market. And the return divided by the risk is the Sharpe ratio. And it is four, multifamily has a 4.6 times better Sharpe ratio than the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. So um, Sharpe ratio shows multifamily and other commercial investing is far more stable and more profitable over the long term uh, than most of these other asset classes. And self-storage actually has even a better Sharpe ratio than multifamily and it performed as well or maybe a little better during the last great recession. So hats off to that as well. Foreclosure rate. The foreclosure rate of multifamily during the peak of the Great Recession was as high as 0.8%, and the foreclosure rate for Fannie and Freddie in general was as high as 4%. So it was actually, it's actually much lower. And now the, sharp, the foreclosure rate in multifamily nationwide is something like 0.02 or 002%. So it's just a tiny, tiny fraction. So multifamily, very safe, very profitable. A lot of people love it. People from around the world are investing in it. And that's why I called it uh, The Perfect Investment. I wrote a book called The Perfect Investment, which is an arrogant title, isn't it? And um, we talk about why the balance of risk and return and the major demographic factors such as millennials, uh, immigration, and um, the baby boomers moving into rental housing is causing us to be able to look down the road decades to come and see that multifamily is going to be a great investment. So it's the perfect investment. Yay, we're done. Not really. The problem is the perfect investment becomes the imperfect investment when you can't find any deals that make sense. There's a lot of people rushing after multifamily. And so whether you're trying to buy a duplex, a fourplex, a hundred plex, whatever you're trying to buy, you're probably having a hard time finding deals. I know my company, Wellings Capital, is having a really hard time finding deals. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about how to find deals. Like I said, the competition's tough. You have to have liquidity. You have to sometimes be tempted at least to overpay. By the way, if you have to uh, count on appreciation to make a deal work, run the other way. It's better not to do a deal at all. Uh, than to overpay for an asset. Uh, the, you have to have net worth, you have to convince brokers that you're credible and that you can, you know, for a commercial deal, they don't have to present all the offers. You have to convince a broker that you should get this deal. Uh, and sometimes you won't even be the high offer. They won't even present the high offer if they don't think they're credible. So if you don't have credibility, if you don't have a background, you might be wondering, how can I get that credibility? How can I get that background? Hey, Michael from Poughkeepsie. Hey, Sakina from New Jersey. Hey, Liberate America from Israel. Uh, Larry Moore, Melmed, Keith, Gary. Man, it's so great to have all of you this morning. So, uh, we're going to talk about seven different paths to get in to multifamily investing. And I'm going to let you all vote on what is the easiest path because this is called the easiest way to invest in multifamily. The answer is there isn't one answer. You may be in a situation in a place in life where it makes sense for you to do it one way and go down one path and get to your goal. And somebody else on this uh, live event today might have a different path that makes more sense for them. And so I'm going to be discussing these different paths and I'm gonna let you tell me which is the easiest path for you and then we're gonna have a great time for questions at the end. So path number one, start small and grow big. Now you may want to just get a whole lot of duplexes. You may want to, you know, buy a duplex and then 10 more then 20 more and whatever, and that's fine. Okay. But you may want to grow large and you may at some point realize that the economies of scale of, of, of owning a 100 unit apartment building apartment complex is better than 50 duplexes, okay, or 25 fourplexes. There's so many reasons for this. So one way, one path is to start small and go up. Now, there's a great book. I talked about it on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Brandon likes this book as well. It's the Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings by Steve Burgess. I have no financial incentive in this, and Steve Burgess, I do not know. But Steve, if you're out there, you wrote a great book. 
But in this book, he talks about this path and he talks about why you can grow really, really well with this path by continuing to do the BRRR strategy with multifamily. He doesn't call it that, but he talks about it and he has it laid out for you. So uh, that's one path. I know a guy in Arlington, Texas, who started with $1,000 bonus in his paycheck. He was an airline mechanic in 1993, and he's parlayed that into a $12 million uh, portfolio of multifamily. And what he kept doing is he kept going in, buying, fixing it up, renting it out, refinancing or, or selling, and then buying a bigger one. He went from a two to a four to an eight. When I met him, he had 132 units. He was selling and going up from there. So that could really work. It's a long path, and I highly recommend that you get, uh, that you get property managers because if you try to do it on your, cell, on your own, you can, and that guy in Arlington, Texas did it. It's really hard. It's a long, hard path. Now, that is the long, slow climb to the top of the mountain. Here's the opposite. This is scaling the mountain face, and that is be a millionaire. Oh, what? If you're a millionaire, if you just got an inheritance or a big check or you just sold your Apple stock or whatever, um, you can just jump right into this. If you have you know, two, three, four, five million dollars, you can jump right in at this larger level. So that's the second path. It's not available to most of us, but to the people it is, you know, it's, you still have to convince brokers. You still have to convince sellers. You still have to convince lenders that you're credible to jump in at that level. But some people do it and some people succeed. It's risky. So path one, start small, grow large. Path two, be a millionaire. Path three, be a deal finder. Now this is a little more realistic. I know a guy in Chicago named Dan. Dan, for 23 or 24 years, he's been finding deals. He's developed all these relationships all around the country with commercial brokers, and he sends deals to companies like Wellings Capital, like my company and other companies. And when he sends those deals, he gets a piece of ownership in that deal. Now, he's not a broker, but he gets a piece of ownership, and he's got a piece of ownership in dozens of deals because he's a deal finder. This can be really good. And so if you've got access to you know, somebody you know who owns multifamily, they might want to sell, and they don't want to use a broker, or if you've got access to brokers who would bring you and show you deals pre-market, if you've got some other great way to find off-market deals or pre-market deals, great, become a deal finder. The great part about this is you not only get ownership, let's say it was you know, maybe 10% of uh, the ownership of a deal. So uh, this is more detail than I wanna get into, but let's just say if I owned 30% of an apartment complex, I might be willing to give you 10% of my share, okay? Like 10% of my 30% to bring the deal. This would not be as brokerage commission. This would be, you would be part of the ownership team. And the great part about that is the profit and all that. But another great part about it is you get to learn the business. You get to hang out with the syndicator and go through all the different steps to learn the business. And so highly recommend being a deal finder. Now, it's tough because right now, a lot of people are competing for a very few deals for sale, but it is possible. So a third way, a third path is being a deal finder. A fourth path is being a money finder. Now this is fraught with uh, potential pitfalls. You could uh, offend the, um, our, our friends at the uh, SEC. You could cause uh, all kinds of problems by being a money finder because you could be judged if you get a commission for finding money, it's a huge, huge no-no. So don't try to say, hey, I'll bring you a million dollars to the syndicator, give me 3%, unless you're a licensed financial planner or a licensed individual, okay? So if you wanna go this route, you've gotta check out the SEC requirements. There are books about this, uh, and if someone pings me offline, I can tell you a book where you can find out about all about this. But you can be a money finder and you can actually join a team. You can say, look, I'll bring the money, you do everything else, we'll join together, and then you literally partner with somebody because you have access uh, to money, to family offices, to your own inheritance, whatever. You can be a money finder and be part of a deal. And I know a guy in Austin, Texas named Andrew. He's active on Bigger Pockets. 
and he partnered with a friend of mine named Reed. A lot of you guys know Reed Goosens, who's on Bigger Pockets as well and has a podcast. And they partnered together and they're doing a great job. Andrew's raising the money, Reed's finding the deals and doing the asset management, and they're a great team. So that is another path. Okay, so the fifth path is being a passive investor. And I'm thinking a lot more and more about this path lately. There's three ways to be a passive investor. There's probably more. Number one, you can find a syndicator. Now spend a lot of time doing due diligence on the syndicator. Give them a criminal background check. Check out you know, their SEC in different states. Google their name. Ask hard questions. Go meet with them in person. Vet the syndicator really well. Now, if you vet the syndicator, then you become, you can become a passive passive investor with them. And what I mean by that is you can just trust. If you really trust the syndicator, you don't have to dive into all the details of every single deal. You can just say, okay, I'm just going to give you, let's say $50,000 per deal, a multifamily or whatever, and then invest with you. That's a passive, passive route. Then an active passive route is where you learn all the details, all the financials, all the due diligence uh, qualifications, and you actually go out and check out every deal that that syndicator is doing. That's becoming, let's say, an active passive investor. And there's a guy named Jeremy Roll and another guy named Hunter Thompson, who I'm fr- named Hunter Thompson. Those guys are both in LA. They're doing a great job being active passive investors. They check out every deal. They, they understand the numbers. They understand the due diligence. They fly to the locations. And they are doing a great job investing in a lot of deals. And I really admire them. Now, I, about a month ago, on Bigger Pockets Live, I showed how someone could take $100,000 and if invested properly for about 30 or say 40 years, that 100,000 could become several million dollars. And I've done those calculations quite a few times and it's hard to believe you could take 100,000, let's say pluck it out of your home equity or from the money that you have from whatever source and you could turn into say four, five, six million dollars. But I've checked it with different people the numbers are legit. It really is possible to do that. Um, you've got to really, really find the right syndicator and really trust them to do that passively. But you don't have to quit your day job to do that. So that is number five. Don't quit your job. Guess what number six is? Go get a job. Now, a lot of you are on Bigger Pockets and on here this morning and probably want to give me a thumbs down because you don't want to have a job. You're trying to get out of your day job. You probably don't want to hear that I said get a job. But if you're in a position to, one route into this business might be to become, let's say, a commercial real estate broker. You could do residential, but commercial real estate broker, or get a job with an asset manager on an asset management team, or become a property manager. And I know people who have gone all three of those routes to get into this business. John Cohen's a friend of mine. He's from New York City. John became a commercial broker. He got to know the business really well. He did all kinds of work with commercial brokerage, and then he became a syndicator. And there's a guy, I know a guy who got a college degree from Virginia Tech in property management. He actually went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and then Atlanta, and he actually started his own property management firm. And now he is deeply in the business as a, um, you know, I said that wrong. He got a job, he got a college degree in property management, then he started his own brokerage firm. But there are people who actually are uh, property managers, like a guy named Rick Graff from Pinnacle. He's the CEO of the third, second or third largest property management firm in the world. He also owns um, pro- uh, properties on the side, from what I understand. So get a job. That's another route into this. You could go to college, you could get a college degree at places like Baylor or Virginia Tech in property management or real estate management or commercial uh, real estate. Uh, There's more and more, I know people getting those degrees at Georgetown. Uh, uh, One, there's a, uh, in somewhere in New York has a great degree, I think it's Columbia. And so check those out, get a job, get, take that path. Now that's an unlikely path for most people here, I know, but I just want to point it out. Now the seventh and final path is the path that I went down and that is get a mentor. I spent $25,000 when I decided to firmly plant myself in class B value add multifamily. I spent, my partner and I spent about $25,000 hiring a mentor. And when we hired a mentor, uh, we were very careful not to get one of the gurus 
who do, you know, the, um, the, the thing where they bring you to a weekend seminar, they teach you a lot, and then they say, oh, if you want to learn more, pay us 10000 more, and we'll do this next weekend event. If you want to learn more, spend 30000 more. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about hiring a really good mentor, a coach. I know quite a few mentors. I don't do this personally, but I know quite a few uh, who are hanging around bigger pockets. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, reach out to me at my bigger pockets, um, on bigger pockets, I can point you to a mentor or two that I really like. And so I could point you to mine for $25,000, or I can point you to somebody who is doing some boot camps for as little as one to $2,000, and they're doing a great job as well. And there's a lot of people in the five to $15,000 range. I've got a friend named Whitney Sewell, Whitney is with LifeBridge Capital. He's got a big goal in his life to fund the adoption of orphans around the world. What did he do? He paid quite a bit of money with a mentor, and he is actually developing a daily podcast now. Uh, his mentor is coaching him because he's got a daily podcast as well in real estate investment. And um, uh, he is learning the ropes from this mentor and he is doing a great job, and I'm, I'm really sure that in a couple years he'll be really successful. So, those are the seven paths. Which one is easiest for you? Would love to hear, but more importantly, I'd love to hear your questions today. So you can type your questions in, and I'll spend most of the rest of this time answering your questions. If you like this information, please give me a like, give us a share, give us a thumbs up, give me a smiley face at least. I would love to hear from you if this information is helpful. Uh, the seven paths again, if you joined us late, number one, start small and then grow your portfolio. Step two, if you're already a millionaire or have access to millions, just start large. Number three, be a deal finder. Number four, be a multifamily money finder. Be careful with that one. Number five, be a passive investor. Number six, get a job. Number seven, find a mentor. So I'm going to take a drink and give you all a chance to uh, ask me some questions. All right, so I'm not gonna be able to go in order here. I gotta tell you guys, I'm so sorry. Uh, on the Facebook site, and I know you, you millennials think it's just because I'm old, um, I, can, I, I cannot find a way to see all the questions. And so uh, it's possible that I'll, I'll do my best to uh, answer all the questions I can, but if you typed a question into Facebook and I didn't get it within five minutes, please cut and paste it and put it in again, okay? Thanks, Jorge. Okay, Ben, I hear Ben Leibowitz is great for a lot less than 25,000, LOL. Hey, Ben, I've seen you on here before. Would like to start a, start small, I'm a newbie, okay, Brenda, that sounds good. Um, it's hard to find any deals right now, even small ones, but uh, they can be found. Uh, a lot of what you might want to do right now is drive around, look at apartments, and even write handwritten letters. I know a guy who's killing it writing handwritten, personalized letters to owners, and he actually says something about their complex. Hey, I like the new petunias. What? That, I pl that you planted outside recently, and I noticed those, and I really want to tell you that if I take over your complex, here's what I'm going to do to continue to help you. And if you tell them that you, you know, if you know that you might want to keep the current staff, when you write them a letter or when you contact an owner, like if you want to keep the current property manager, if this is a larger property, tell them that because a lot of these people really don't want to sell or they're worried about selling because they don't want to lay off their staff. So Nicholas says, what's your best advice for a young guy starting out to build a large portfolio? I do have a capital base and I want to develop a large portfolio over time. Nicholas, you may want to reach out to me after the show and we can just do a discussion offline about your particulars. Um, I mean, I'm a little biased. I, I might, Nicholas, consider doing uh, some passive investments. And if you have enough capital to work with, what you can do is tell the syndicator, hey, I want to put in, let's say, $150,000, but I want to learn this business. Would you let me tag along with you? So that's a way to do that. Um, Fernando says, very useful information. Thank you. Thank you. My question, what do you think about the Bay Area, California for multifamily? Does it even exist? I'd be worried about the rent controls out in Oakland and the Bay Area. But hey, an hour and a half 
or is it two hours uh, just east of you, northeast, Sacramento? Fastest rent growth in America, and the prices are still somewhat realistic. So if you can make the hour and a half or so drive to Sacramento, I think you might find some better ways to get involved in multifamily uh, and to find some deals that make more sense. Okay, I'm going to switch over briefly here to the YouTube side, and I can see all the comments on YouTube, but it, there's like hundreds. So anyone looking for deals in New York or New Jersey, you can get with Terrell. Keith says start small. Yep. Um, is the right time to buy income property now since it's so inflated? Uh, I've been writing a lot about that on Bigger Pockets, and I think it's a very dangerous time to buy right now. And I've got some other strategies that I like, like being an Airbnb, Airbnb arbitrage landlord. And if anybody wants to talk about that, like throw it up on the question board and we'll see if we have time to talk about it. I don't know if we'll have time today. Uh, you can reach out to me privately about Airbnb arbitrage landlord, by the way. I'm getting ready to write a, a Bigger Pockets post on that. Uh, please name some mentors, someone says. Hey, Sister Lots. Um, I use 37th Parallel, and I already told you what I spent on that, but that was a one-time fee, and I'm still talking to them four and a half years later. They still help me, so love them. Hey, Matthias from Lynchburg. I'm a big fan of your book. I would just um, want to appreciate all the information. Matthias, thank you for saying that. I'm in Lynchburg, Virginia as well. Uh, you probably knew that. So, uh, Warren, which cities do you invest in? I like cities. I have 22 criteria. Uh, if you reach out to me, I can share some of those criteria with folks, but I like high net population migration, low unemployment, a diverse economy. I like uh, places where there are schools, hospitals, government jobs. Uh, I like cities where Amazon HQ2 is coming. <laughs> uh, did I say that? I, I'm thinking it's going to be Northern Virginia. Who, who thinks it's going to be Northern Virginia? Give me a thumbs up or a like or a share. It's not because I'm from Virginia. I'm not even from that area. But um, some people think it's going to be Raleigh. So I don't know. Is there an income property cycle like a housing cycle? Um, hmm. It's not as bad. It's not as much. Uh, I'll tell you that the cycles are more pronounced in places like Florida, Nevada, Arizona, and California. And that's why I don't invest in locations like that because it's introducing an additional level of risk on top of the risk that's already inherent in any investment. So I actually don't like investing in places like that. Someone asked where I invest. Uh, you can make more money in those places, by the way, but you can also lose money more likely. In fact, uh, the, a lot of the losses in the last Great Recession were in those four states. Um, Lee Bryan says, I have an offer on a duplex. I would have to pay utilities. Would it make sense to add another hyd hydrometer? Is it costly? Um, I don't know. It's probably about $400 to add a water meter to allow, uh, to allow you to monitor the use of water in the apartment. I can tell you, you can spend $100 extra from a leaky toilet flapper. Um, and uh, in, in a month or two, you can waste tens of thousands of gallons a month from leaky toilet flappers. And so I can tell you, I would always install a water, uh, a, a water meter at every location. And they're like four or $500 uh, per unit. And it should pay for itself and allows you to build back the tenant. Uh, Combative says rehab even when the market is at its peak. Um, I can't really answer that. Can you qualify that question a little bit more? Hey, Arturo, what's the best way to verify current rents in a deal? Uh, Allie, uh, get a rent roll. But if you can find a way without offending people to go and hang around there, walk past the place when people are coming home from work and just ask them, hey, what's the cost of rent here? Something like that. Um, people can lie. People can lie. Uh, and you should put in your letter of intent or your contract that if you find out later that they did lie to you, that you can have a charge against them or you can walk away from the deal. Uh, I walked away from one deal once because we found out something that was concealed. And um, so Jean-Pierre Martinez Lugo says, would you consider breaking even and making no profit with your first owner-occupied duplex 
investment a win. So if you're going to be on one side of the duplex and you've got a renter on the other side and you can break even, meaning you're not putting any cash in your pocket, but you have no mortgage payment, no tax, I consider that a huge win. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying, but I would consider that a huge win. So, okay, I'm going to jump back on YouTube and see if I can help a little here. Mariano Medrano. I just put that little roll of the R in there so you think I was smart. I have 150K duplex that rents each unit for 800. I can cash flow $140 using the rental calculator on BP. Is that a good deal? Um, you know, I like to see at least $100 a unit. Um, and you said 140, it sounds like that's 140 total. That's cutting it pretty close. Um, I wouldn't say don't do it, but I would say if you consider the Airbnb arbitrage or corporate housing, you can probably raise your uh, profit from $140 to, I don't know, three, four, five, seven hundred dollars $700 instead of $140. And, um, it's just a little bit more effort, a little marketing involved, and it's not just with Airbnb. I just call it the Airbnb arbitrage because it's easy to say and it's fun to say. So um, I got some crazy statistics on Airbnb. Did you know that there's Airbnb has more uh, rooms rented every night than Marriott? Marriott started in 1956. Airbnb started in 2008 and they have far more rooms and they're in far more countries of the world than Marriott, the largest hotel chain in the world. And so, uh, no, I think that Airbnb uh, arbitrage, Airbnb landlording, corporate housing, which there's a whole strategy for this that I'm actually, uh, we bought a program to teach us this strategy. We're actually gonna do it at my 125 unit apartment complex in Lexington, Kentucky. We're so pumped about it because you should be able to make a significantly higher profit with a little more effort. Tony, how did you start? Maybe I should listen to your podcast again. I started by flipping houses in a really depressed market and I got really depressed. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, sometimes I was depressed, but um, anyway, seriously. Um, yeah, I started by that and then I did subdivisions. Uh, I, I did one or two subdivisions. I did a, a large multifamily from the ground up. It was actually a quasi hotel in North Dakota. Then I did a Hyatt hotel and went mm -hmm. and um, uh, then I got into uh, class B multifamily. Loving it. Oh, Lee Bryan says, okay, so you asked about, okay, we already answered that. Um, your job doesn't have to be real estate related. That's right, Tony, but I was thinking that if you did get a real estate related job, that was a path for you to get in to multifamily. Tony says, being a passive investor is a good idea for some people. I personally think the returns are lower and the risk is higher. Uh, yeah, you can think that and you may be right because you're introducing more risk once you place money with somebody else. So you better know them really, really well. You may be right. Um, the returns are certainly shared, but you're sharing them with somebody who's an expert and I could give you tons of stories about how these experts can probably make a lot more money uh, and have more to share than you might make on your own. At least that's been my experience. So would you consider breaking? Okay, got that. Okay, a few questions. Okay, if you've got a question on Facebook, now would be a perfect time to plow it in because I'm back over here and I can not I can only see five or six at a time and it's not just because I'm incompetent. Uh, Laura says, we want a vacation home to get away from Texas in the heat. We want to make it an Airbnb. What are good cities? Laura, I would look for an Airbnb in areas near a lot of extended stay hotels, Homewood Suites, Extended Stay America. If you can get one in those areas, you can guess that there's probably some corporate traffic. Did you know that something like 36% of all travel nights right now are stayed by people staying somewhere over a month? So there's actually a market for some longer term stays, not just Airbnb. And this is what I'm talking about with strategy. Um, you can actually capture some corporate travel. And if you can get a nurse, an engineer, someone in training, someone in pilot school who has a budget of say $1,500, $1, $2,000 a month, and even get two of them in your duplex um, or maybe a two bedroom apartment, and furnish that apartment, let's say you rent that apartment out typically for $800. Well, now you furnish it. Now you've got all these other costs and risk of the furnishings 
which should be about $3,000, by the way, for a typical apartment. Internet, electric, water. But now you can rent that for, say, fifteen to 2000 a month instead of 800 a month. And there is some huge, there's some make people making some huge money doing this. Laura says more on Airbnb. What are the best cities? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I think there's a way to figure that out, Laura. I'm just not an expert. I know there are people who know how to do that. What's the name of the book you posted? Uh, it was The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings by Steve Burgess, and that's spelled B-E-R-G-E-S. And that was from Brenda. Hey, Brenda, hope that helped. Jonathan says, I have $60,000 to start, and I want to make $60,000 a year. Is it possible for me to own multifamily out of my state? I live in San Francisco Bay. Yeah, there's a there's a book, a Bigger Pockets book calling buy, called Buying Out of State real estate um it's not called that it's called some it's something about buying out of state check that out on bigger pockets check out the articles on that some really uh some people at bigger pockets have written about that and a lot of people i talk to every every week are from the bay area and they're wanting to invest out of state patrick says i'm looking at a duplex next to a hospital and a university i'm trying to figure out the best way to go short-term lease or airbnb so University of Kentucky Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky has a shortage. They have like a whole floor or something of the hospital. They're not even opening because they have such a shortage of nurses. And they're trying to bring in nurses and they're, they're, they're bringing in all these corporate, I mean, these traveling nurses and oh, therapists as well. And so these people all have a very large, significantly large budget for housing. And so if you can find, if you are in a place near uh, a hospital or a university, I think it's a great opportunity for you to find, uh, to provide furnished corporate housing and then use Airbnb to fill in the gaps. Ah, I just gave a little piece of the strategy there. So start with their, furnish it, do everything you're supposed to do, start on Airbnb, keep a short lease on the a leash on the Airbnb. You know, it's only rented out say a month ahead. And then go in and look for extended stay or Homewood Suites or other type of people who are needing this long-term corporate housing. Then get people, plug them in there that have, you know, that want to stay for six or 12 months. And then when they leave, plug in Airbnb again and look for another corporate housing tenant. I know of a guy who lived way out in the sticks and he kept saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. Um, I don't know how to find a tenant. So he finally went to his local regional airport and he took a basket of flowers or candy or something to the receptionist. She let him meet the manager of the airport. And then he said, I've got these two duplexes I'd like to rent out. They're going to be furnished. And the manager got in his car, followed him back to these duplexes. He said, I'll sign a six month lease right now. Can you provide me 58 more? What? He was looking for 60 of these. This was way out in the sticks. And so uh, this guy scrambling, trying to figure out how to make that work. But I met a guy at a, a seminar who, in the middle of the morning, he had a beer in his hand, beer on his breath. He was in sandals. Everybody else was dressed nice. And he said he had 21 of these corporate rentals and he was traveling the world full time uh, for fun because he had it all dialed into a system. So I believe it's possible. I believe it's profitable. And I think a lot of people should try it. Brenda says, I'm an Airbnb newbie. What is an Airbnb? I'm a newbie. Oh, just, you know, like a, a nightly stay, like VRBO, vacation rentals by owner, uh, Airbnb. I'm sorry, I didn't mean a B and B. Um, so um, I'm switching over here. Damien says, any mentors in wholesaling? I don't know. You stumped me. If anybody knows a wholesale mentor, please post it to the YouTube chat. Okay. Uh, Conquistador says how to get credits after contract on CapEx and other items. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's really not a great idea to retrade. And so if, if you're talking about locking in a price and then finding out later, oh, wait a minute, there's broken sidewalks and there's bad roofs and all that, that leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. And so retrading is possible to do if there's some super hidden item like mold in the basement of one of the buildings that, that you want to get, you know, like you want to get remediated. But 
um, yeah, it's it, retraining is a little rough. So, um, okay, Chris says, can you rent out multifamily homes like duplexes as student housing if they're near colleges? Yeah, I think you should. I think you should consider that, Chris. Is that a good idea because each bedroom is considered a unit? I'm only 15. What? You're only 15. Thumbs up, Chris. That's awesome, man. I think that a great strategy for you to consider at 15 would be Airbnb or corporate housing or student housing arbitrage, meaning you don't own the unit. You don't have to come up with the tens of thousands in down payment. You don't have to come up with a big loan. You go rent a unit. You go in, clean it, paint it, fix it up, furnish it. You can even rent the furnishings if you're, you know, if you want to, and then you rent it out as a furnished unit. And you can do by the bed uh, for students, or you can do six, 12 months, etc. So great question. If you're 15, my hat's off to you for being on bigger pockets. Great job, Chris. I see you've commented before. Can you rent out multifamily homes as student housing close to colleges? Absolutely. Ice says, would you recommend wholesaling single family homes to build capital to invest in multifamily? Absolutely. Great plan. Uh, how would you know the ARV 70% rule for buying flip or BRR properties? Is that still acceptable in this market? You know, I know what you're talking about. Um, I, I, I think, I think it is. I mean, there's, there's going to be a day when, you know, when the market turns. And so make sure if you guys are doing flip houses, make sure you stage your home. I know it can cost an extra two or $3,000. By the way, if you stage a home and do it really well and completely, you can actually rent it on Airbnb while you're waiting to sell it. I don't recommend that. There's some hassles with that, but you could do it. But um, yeah, if you stage it, you can actually raise the resale price, the ARV, by a lot. I won't say 10, 20, 50,000, but I've raised mine 40, 50,000 many times and got it um, by really doing a phenomenal job staging and photographing these properties. So um, you don't want to make your proposal, you don't want to make your 70% rule contingent on staging. You want to take the worst case scenario, but when you're down the road with this flip, you should consider staging. I stage every home I ever flip. And I haven't done it, uh, any for a couple of years, but I always, every time I do it, I'm happy that I did. Um, Jason says, okay, Connor Steinbrook's a great wholesaling investor mentor. So again, I don't know who that is, but thanks, Jason Toledo. Hey, Rodriguez says, what is the cost to add electric or gas meter to a multifamily that landlord pays all? Okay, that's a really good thing to do. We actually added gas meters for like $50, I think, um, on top of our water and sewer because the water and sewer had a router with it. And then the gas measurement tool, the gas measurement um, uh, meter was able to actually be tapped into that same router, which saved us some money. Um, okay, so is multifamily considered commercial? Okay, great question, family. Uh, family Paulfus, um, residential multifamily is duplex, triplex, or fourplex. So it's all considered residential. You can get a residential loan. You have to sign for the loan yourself, etc. Commercial is considered five units or above. There's small commercial multifamily, which is five to about 75 units. And then there's, uh, and that's small, small commercial multifamily. And then there's large scale or uh, regular commercial multifamily that would be 75 or so units and above in most markets and that means you can get a commercial non-recourse loan it also means you can um, uh, put an on-site property management team on there and, and that number varies but 75 is kind of the general number we consider it, uh, as a cutoff but commercial is five units and above you'll need a commercial loan and you will not have the same rules. Even the um, fair housing rules are different if you have a few units versus a bunch of units. Um, Robert says, what's your thought on getting an SBA loan to get rental property? Yeah, if you can get that, that's fantastic, Robert. Uh, I have nothing uh, to say, uh, nothing bad about that. There's also a Sable, S-A-B-A-L, that's a company. I don't know them real well, but uh, they apparently have small balance loans that they deal in and that would be like a million dollar loan as opposed to a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac say a 10 million dollar loan 
Uh, can an LLC purchase multifamily residential? Absolutely. What about buying rentals in Detroit? Sergi says, uh, yeah, I used to live there. I've heard great things about it. I'm still a little nervous. I remember what it was like driving downtown and seeing 16,000 burnout buildings or unoccupied buildings when I lived there 21 years ago. Um, so yeah, it's a little rough for me, but I mean, I've heard good things about Detroit. Okay, on Facebook, Patrick says, I'm looking at duplex. Okay, I answered that. Wow, I feel good about myself. Damon says, I have 20 long-term rentals that are performing. Experts like Grant Cardone recommend that I sell all of these and throw the proceeds into a large multifamily. What things should I consider in making this decision? Well, Damon, that is uh, Damon Santa Maria. Good job. Uh, that is quite an accomplishment in itself. I completely agree with Grant Cardone. I don't know that I have time to get into the answer here. Let me see if I can touch it. Uh, there are so many reasons that could be a good idea. Um, but the economies of scale, you know, having one or two roofs instead of 20, having one place where all the maintenance people go, having one place, I mean, there's so many good reasons. I know a company that had hundreds of single family homes and they said 100 unit apartment was far easier than all of those, as you can imagine. So uh, we can talk about different ways to do that. If you heard the seven paths I did about half an hour ago on here, you can pick one of those paths and find one that makes sense. I will warn you and I'll warn every one of you in the sound of my voice that it's very, very hard to find multifamily right now. It may be a great time to sell your portfolio of 20, Damon, but it may be really, really hard to find a good deal in multifamily. If you can find one and lock it up long enough to sell off your 20 single families, man, my hat's off to you. Go for it. Of course, you could take path number five and invest passively. But let's face it, even if you're investing with a company like mine, we're having a hard time finding good deals. So just because I'm a large syndicator or someone else is a large syndicator, it doesn't mean we're finding great deals and profitable deals. And right now, you know, your, your cash flowing 20 units might be cash flowing better than what you flipped into. So be careful. Uh, tough time to sell. It'd be, wouldn't it be a dream if you could sell right now at the peak of the market and then somehow hold that money in a pretty decent income producing thing like with Dave Van Horn's notes or something, make about 10 or 12% and then wait for the market to turn and then buy multifamily down on the trough. That sounds like a smart Warren Buffett thing to do, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> John Johnson said, whoever asked for the wholesale mentor, I have a great one. Private message me. Okay, so Sean Johnson, that's S-H-A-W-N, uh, on the Facebook side, YouTube people, you can't see that, um, said that uh, the this is not a guru, just a guy who's been wholesaling for many years. I offered half the profit on my deal in exchange for something. And so Sean says, private message them. And it's Sean Johnson. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Ice says, I live in Detroit. It's rough. You got to know the area. Metro Detroit is cool. I've heard that area around Woodward and Cass, which used to be the worst area, scary area. I used to go down there and, and meet with people um, in um, drug houses, uh, crack houses, etc. in a suit and tie when I got off work at Ford Motor Company because I was trying to do this outreach. Uh, I have a real heart for people and I really hated, my wife and I hated that they were living in trapped lives. And we would go in there and I had a, a lady warn me, get out of here, you're going to get shot after dark. And so anyway, it's, it was actually a much more graphic story than that. If you were one on one with me sitting here, I'd tell you what she really said. Chris who's 15, says one of the best way, ways to learn all this information, like all the terms that you need to know to get into this kind of business, should I look for a mentor in my area? Chris, you can learn so, so much from Bigger Pockets. You could spend, I don't know how many years reading the posts on Bigger Pockets. You get a lot of conflicting information. Um, a mentor would be a great thing to do. Uh, the um, I'm trying to think, if you reach out to me, I can try to give you the information on that $1,000 uh, guy who has an upcoming boot camp for, um, uh, for multifamily. Um, there are books out there. Like I said, I wrote a book. There are other books on multifamily. Bigger Pockets is going to release a new book. I think by the end of the year on multifamily, you should look for 
Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, there's just, again, there's just not one path for everybody, but, you know, Chris, I'm really admiring you at 15 for trying to get into this. Um, and if you want to talk about Airbnb landlord type stuff, you know, like I said, you can reach out to me. Galvin says BP podcast and forums, then get a mentor, Chris. I love it. That's great. Great advice. Um, Sister Locke says, do you know the private investment group Lifestyles Unlimited out of Texas syndicators? Yeah. I actually met Brad Sumrock in January at uh, the National Multifamily Housing Conference, and a lot of people really love them. I can't, I don't know enough to personally uh, recommend or not recommend them. Brenda says, mentor in Toledo, Ohio. I've been through Toledo many times on I-75. Uh, Brenda, and uh, I actually think with the, the market, the world we're in right now, you don't need a local mentor. You can actually find one like I did online and who you work with by phone and meet with them once a year or whatever. Just to let you all know, we have about 10 minutes left. So if you're going to like, share, give me a thumbs up, uh, it would be, now would be the best time to do that. Bernie B says, what about mobile home parks? Bernie, I'm actually investigating mobile home parks and I'm just making uh, plans to go meet with a guy who runs mobile home parks right now. Uh, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And so be sure that you uh, invest with people who are doing it right. You do not, in my opinion, you don't want to own mobile homes. If you own them when you buy the park, owner finance them or sell them or whatever as soon as you can off to the different people. Uh, and, and there's some legal ramifications of owner financing. I don't know about all those. Uh, how can we find syndicators, says King David Lives. Um, um, I don't know where to start. To, uh, you can just reach out to me. Um, there are syndicators. Grant Cardone has been mentioned on this call, on this, uh, on this today. Um, Wellings Capital, my company. Uh, there is uh, Joe Fairless, uh, Reed Goosens, Jake and Gino. They're involved on Bigger Pockets. There's all kinds of syndicators who are doing all kinds of different deals right now. Uh, like I've told a lot of people, I'm getting involved in self-storage. And if you want to talk about self-storage syndicators, uh, reach out to me. Again, I'm Paul Moore. I'm with Wellings Capital. You can reach out to me here. Uh, any mentors in Wisconsin anyone knows of? Tony, um, I know of somebody doing self-storage in Wisconsin. That's about it. Uh, Jermaine Hill says, are you buying under a corporation or LLC better, better write-offs or LLC building lines of credit under your corp? Uh, Jermaine... I would say under an LLC is just fine. It's a little less hassle and there are some, probably some tax and other benefits of an LLC. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that would be a way, that's the way I go. So Galvin says to Chris, he's willing to reach out and help him. That's awesome. If you guys want to help each other on here, that would just be fantastic. Allison says in the BRRRR strategy, when you when do you typically refinance and how long do you typically hold and rent before you repeat? Allison, I have done that. Uh, the BRRRR, by the way, is a popular term on bigger pockets. I think Brandon Turner has invented this, but it's, I'll probably get it wrong. You watch. It's buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Ha <laughs> ha, I think I got it. And uh, anyway, how long, Allison? I really just can't answer that. I mean, some people can turn over these. If you can buy it right, and if you can rent it right, you can actually refinance in like a year. Some people refinance in six months, especially if you have a local lender who will work with you on that kind of stuff. And then you can pull out your safe equity and go repeat it. So uh, I have a friend named Jack who's doing that right now. So syndicators cannot help non-accredited in most cases, says Tony. Uh, that's mostly true. One of the ways to passively invest is through crowdfunding websites. I have no you know, personal connection to any, but uh, they do work. Some of the uh, syndicators on the crowdfunding sites work with non-accredited. Uh, and there are companies that I'm aware of who are setting up deals right now specifically for non-accredited investors. Uh, for time's sake, you'll have to look at that on your own. Motley Fool says, will you be doing any Reg A plus offerings? No. I won't be. Um, that, I think that's for non-accredited folks. And I met a guy the other day who said he was spending an enormous amount of money to get set up to do Reg A uh, offerings. 
Uh, thank you, family Pulpus. Appreciate that. RJ Hogan says, how does refinancing work and how do you know when to do it? Well, if you put 50,000 down on a house and then you put 10,000 into it, now you've got 60,000 into it and you rent it for 800 a month and now you can get an appraiser to come out and say it's worth 100,000. Let's say you borrowed 40,000 originally do that. So you've got 40,000 loan, 10,000 of your own money in it, 10,000 more of your own or an investor's money in it to fix it up. Now you refinance it for $70,000, okay? Now you pay off the $40,000 loan, you pay back the 20 back to you or you and your investor, and you've got 10,000 cash sitting there on top of that. So now you turned your 20,000 cash into 30,000 cash. You've got a $70,000 loan. You've got a payment of, I'm making this up guys, say $500 a month and you're collecting 800 a month in rent. So you're putting 300 in your pocket and you have an additional, you have $30,000 to go do it again. And maybe you can even do it twice again with that money. And then you can do two more refinances and then go from there. Um, Colin says, hi, I'm in the New York market. Is it possible to buy with 35,000 in this market or should I save more? From what I've heard, Colin, it seems like it'd be really hard. Um, so um, I don't know how to, to answer that, but I would think it'd be really, really hard. Now you could do the Airbnb or corporate housing arbitrage deal with 35,000. In fact, you could do a bunch of them. So reach out to me if you want to talk about that. Brigitte Napale says, I'm looking for a mentor in South Florida. Um, again, I would go national. Tony's looking for mentors in Wisconsin. Uh, okay, Angela Curtis. Hey, Angela. How do you approach a hospital to see if any residents are looking to rent? Does it have to be furnished? Yes, it does. I'm in the process of purchasing a duplex five minutes from a major hospital. What you'd want to do is go around, start poking around the hospital. Uh, actually, you could go, you could be really... I don't know, I don't know if I want to say this publicly, but you could actually go hang around a Homewood Suites or an Extended Stay of America, go buy a glass of beer or wine in the lobby there and just hang out in the evenings and ask around, hey, any nurses ever stay here? Any physical therapists, any respiratory therapists ever stay here? Any traveling people? And oh no, we, but we used to stay over at the other place and there's a whole bunch over there. And so follow the path, use the uh, breadcrumbs, follow the breadcrumbs and find your way back and then go to the HR staff at that hospital and say, hey, I've got nice furnished housing. It's less expensive than paying home with suites every night and it's nicer because people get their own duplex. Again, this is part of that Airbnb strategy that I'm getting ready to write on in bigger pockets and I'm researching and I actually just spent some money getting a course on this and it rocks, let me tell you. Waterscape House says, would you talk about tax savings and what, you recommend, what your recommendations are when you flip? Are people able to do 1031 in this high market? I don't know if you can find it, but I actually did a whole show just like this one about a month ago on tax savings. In my book, The Perfect Investment has 10 and the new edition is going to have 13 tax saving strategies, including 1031 exchanges. You can actually go find that live event or you can find some old bigger pockets posts that I did. Again, I'm Paul Moore on tax saving strategies. Another one I did this spring called new tax saving strategies uh, from the tax reform act that was passed December 23rd, 2017. Thanks Angela. Appreciate that. Um, okay. I am going to wrap up in two minutes. So if anybody has any last questions, even if you asked them before and I missed them, there's hundreds of questions, especially over here on YouTube. Uh, and I know I missed some. There's 18 more folks here on Bigger Pockets. And I just realized that I am not getting my questions on the Bigger Pockets site. So I'm going to do my very best in this last moment here to pull in the bigger pockets question box. I'm so, so sorry that I didn't get to you guys. You're probably all mad and please don't be bitter. Okay, here we go. So Danny Guerrero says Airbnb seems to require a ton of daily work to keep it going. Also seems like the desired locations would be in the downtown areas, which could require at least 30 minute drive to be workable. Danny, I'm so glad you asked. Um, there is a strategy 
that I, you, if you want to reach out to me, we can talk about it, um, to actually do it much, much easier. Airbnb does require a good deal of work. It requires marketing. It requires daily, hourly interaction sometimes. It requires getting a cleaning person there one or two or who knows how many times a week. The corporate housing model mixed with Airbnb can actually provide far less work for about the same total profit. And so I highly recommend using the Airbnb arbitrage, also called uh, being an Airbnb landlord, also called just get hold of me and I'll tell you more about it, Danny. So um, last few questions. Tony says, would you like better use of the BRRRR or the HELOC and use as a checking account? Hey, y'all, I should have talked about that. There is a strategy out there about using your HELOC to pay down your mortgage really fast, like in five or six years instead of 30. And it's called, I mean, you can go to a website. I think it's called replaceyourmortgage.com. You can check that out yourself. There's also some other sites out there about this. And I've been checking this out and I actually believe it. Uh, Brenda Lyons, which is the best hard loan or private loan. I don't honestly know. I would hope that you could get a private loan if you could. Hard money is somewhat expensive. I know I've got a lot of hard for friends in hard money and it actually could be really good. Uh, Angela says, is this video available to view later? You miss the seven strategies? Absolutely. Chris, thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that and I'm really proud of you for being on here at age 15. That was very kind of you. Colin says, how do I get in touch with Paul? Uh, go to my Bigger Pockets profile and reach out to me and we will connect. I'm also at my company website, which is wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com. You can reach out to me at my website. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, RJ. Appreciate that. Glad you liked the time. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a plug. Give us a share. Give us a like. Give us a smiley face. And we will see you again within the next week here at Bigger Pockets Live. Thank you for joining us. Have a great Saturday. Have a great holiday weekend. And we'll see you next time here at Bigger Pockets Live.